Hi, everyone. I'm Daniel Pickett from Action Figure Insider, and uh, it's a little bit of a weird one, but uh, I'm still very glad that we were able to get together for Comic-Con at home. The good people at Comic-Con, they know we still uh, we love everything that we love, and we even though we can't be in a giant building all together, all 100,000 of us, we're still going to celebrate uh, all the pop culture stuff that we love, and we've been granted another panel. This is our this is Action Figure Insider's 15th anniversary, and this is our 15th anniversary panel that we've done for Comic Con. So, Woo-hoo! yes, there you go. thank you, thank you. Uh, and I've got a great, great uh, uh, group of panelists, which you know, it's it's kind of, you know, we're always trying to look for the silver lining in this weird situation that we we find ourselves in. And uh, things like Randy, who we'll introduce in just a minute. Like Randy used to be on my panels a lot, but then he changed his travel plans at Comic Con, where he, you know, he he would set up and then he'd have enough and then he'd leave. Uh, and so he hasn't been on my panel in a long time. But now, uh, you know, since we're all sort of trapped at home, we're able to gather together. So uh, thank you everyone for for watching, for tuning in. Uh, we very much wish that we could you know, be there looking at all the new stuff, experiencing the reveals, uh, to just talking to each other and just reveling, like, you know, fr- flying our freak flag that we get to do every year at Comic-Con. I, I, I dearly miss it. And who would have thought that Toy Fair would have been the last convention of the year? <laughs> very, very strange. So uh, we'll start, uh, I, I'll sort of, in, you know, say people's names and I'll let you do the introduction of who you are uh, your title and what company you work for. So we'll start. What for me looks like uh, is on my my. Uh, we'll start with Randy over here. Randy. Hey, Randy Falk, um, VP and uh, Director of Product Development for NECA Toys. All right. Then we have Brian. I am Brian Flynn. I am the owner of Super Seven. Then we have Jim. I am Brian, the owner of Super Seven. Wait, what? Oh, oh no! Show. It's a multiverse. <laughs> no one's it's supposed multiverse. to hear that. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, uh, don't tell anybody yet. <laughs> we could probably start that game show we wanted. No, exactly. Okay, well, anyway, I'm actually Jim. Sorry to ruin the surprise. I'm actually Jim Fletcher, the creative director for DC Collectibles. Excellent. Then we have Jeremy. I'm Brian, co-owner of Super Set. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy Fidauer, uh, one of the owners, partners of uh, Jazzwares. Excellent. And then joining us for the first time, this is his first time on a panel, Andrew. Hey, guys. Uh, it's good to be here. Uh, Andrew Perlmutter, uh, president at Funko. Awesome. So uh, we do find ourselves in kind of a, a weird, wacky predicament here. Um, just generally, how was everyone doing? You know, it's just kind of the elephant in the room. I know, like, today, the day we're recording this, for me personally, this is day 102, uh, locked in a house with my children. And uh, <laughs> still still trying to get things done. My wife, you know, we, we're very fortunate that we're both able to keep working from home. But uh, it's been a little nuts. How are you guys doing? Who's going to kick it off? <laughs> yeah. The best looking guy, you. <laughs> that, that, that Randy wins that award. I, I have the grayest looking guy. So, the uh, I, you know, it's been an interesting year. Like, nothing exactly went as planned, obviously, but it's still going well. Obviously, uh, I think everyone will attest here that everybody sitting at home, if they're a collector, has been great for online sales. So uh, that has all trended up. While, you know, a lot of the wholesale stuff obviously has stopped uh, depending on who's open and who's closed. But it's been an interesting thing that it didn't go anywhere near as planned, but it all still sort of made the same plan at the end, at least Hmm. for us. Okay. I'd say it's been pretty good for, uh, you know, thinking of future development stuff. I think there's a lot of room for innovation and things like that to occur at at this point. But... um, yeah, obviously not business as usual. Uh, working from working from home was, I think, it's more challenging for some people than other ones. But um, you know, it's it's just the way it is for now. I do miss going out though and seeing people and eating out and, and stuff like that. So, and seeing the team in person or not is is definitely a different uh, feel. 
Well, I'll, I'll just the news is pop culture hasn't gone away. There's people are still fans of all the things that they were fans of before, and you know we're seeing uh, you know uh, online sales, and and now that the stores are opening back up, right? Like people, you know, our fans, I, dare I say, didn't really skip a beat, right? Like they're uh, which we all knew was going to be the case, right? Just because there's a pandemic doesn't mean we're not going to be fans of uh, you know the characters and the properties that we're fans of. So, but it's been interesting, that's for sure. Yeah, look from a from a business perspective, uh, I think that we we've all sort of braced ourselves for the realities of this long ago. Um, the good news is that we've you know so far so good. Um, with that said, I have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on collectibles in the last. <laughs> <laughs> and I am, I am going to get thrown out of my house. But the good news is that I've created a lot of value for my future ex-wife. <laughs> <laughs> now, Randy, you're in a little bit of a unique position because you just told me before we started that you've actually been in the office the whole time. Whoa. Yeah, um, I have not missed a day. And there's a lot of Saturdays and Sundays in there as well. So we've been... Uh, doing as much as always, but with less people. So uh, wearing even more hats than normal and just working around the clock to keep things moving and adapting to different plans uh, for you know our exclusive delivery this summer since there is no con, stuff like that. And trying to keep everything on track, especially um, you know as we expand our presence in um, places like Target and Walmart, which have stayed open um, and we've gotten more shelf space trying to keep enough product moving out there and restock, uh, you know, to secure that space for the whole year. So, um, it's been busy. It's, it's weird not having anything else to do except work. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah. but it's, it's what it is, um, make the most of it and, uh, try to get further ahead for next year. I think for the most part, the factories are sort of catching back up as you know it hit china first and then you had chinese new year on top of it so i think every one of us faced delays that uh six to eight week delays on anything we had originally planned at at minimum in some cases more um but we're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel from all of that nice yeah and you know i'm not going to ask you guys any sort of you know proprietary or anything but just stuff i have heard from other people in the industry like when when factories first started reopening in China, uh, it was still tough, you know, because Wuhan was still locked down. So trying to get all the amount of workers back to get going again, there were factories like poaching people from other factories, just trying to get things back up and running again, which, you know, is kind of a, a crazy situation to find ourselves in. But I, I think the other thing we've really learned from this is uh, you know, just how important play is and uh, just, you know, how much these, uh, I don't want to call them distractions, but kind of how important our, our fandoms are to keep us uh, active and, and from going nuts, you know, <laughs> uh, and, you know, and, and you know, sort of what Jeremy said earlier, like, ordering stuff in like trying to get you know it's it's that sort of comfort shopping again uh just trying to you know feel a little bit of sense of normalcy um and you know i, I you know i think a lot of us are are staying up late at night <laughs> which you know can lead us down those ebay rabbit holes and and things like that um but yeah it's it's been really interesting to see but i i think it's been kind of spectacular too because it has forced us because everyone's at home, it's sort of shifted our schedule. So, uh, you know, uh, there, there are groups of collectors that I've only known online for years that we've had like some, you know, Friday night Zoom sessions and stuff, which has been really great, like getting to sit and, and, and talk with each other. So, I, you know, the sort of silver lining of it is, I think, um, there's been some really great connections made during this. Now, for you guys, because you have had to uh, kind of shift how you do things a little bit. Have you found anything in this that has worked better that you plan to sort of carry through when things get back to normal as it were? I mean, I, I think the idea in general beforehand, I was always like, you know, you have to be in the office to yeah. really touch and feel the toys to make things work. Like you need that. And I think, 
now the sort of shuttling of prototypes between people and where things get shipped to. I don't think that there's going to be any way that I can honestly assume that my staff is going to be in five days a week going forward. It's probably every meeting going forward is going to be a couple people that are at the office and a couple people that are zooming in or something. I think that part is the very easy part to go forward. I think on the product side, it's a little, it's a little trickier because, uh, you know, you want to bring new things out, but you kind of have to have that, that place where you'll have that, that mass of people in one spot to really see, touch and feel the, the toy. Like how do you get it in front of everybody again? And that's what you really lose with the San Diego or New York going away is that you don't have that concentrated mass of people with eyes on something that can say, oh, okay, I wanna show you something new, talk to you about it, actually engage with you on it. You, that's much harder to do online without it just being some sort of, feels like a cheap car salesman video. I think you're right. I think that the whole way that business looks at uh, in the office, out of the office is going to change. I mean, personally, uh, I, you know, I've taken sick days, but I've never really had a sick day. Like, I don't remember ever really having a sick day. I've always worked from home uh, if I've been not feeling well. And I think that we just need to regroup and, and, and reclassify the way we look at certain things, because I think people would, you know, that I think that vacation days, I think I've worked every vacation day I've ever had, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but no, this is, this is going to, this is going to allow us to all step back and say, how has technology changed the way we approach in the office, out of the office? And for us, you know, for the lack of efficiency, I think people are working a little bit harder, but you know, that also substitutes for their drive time. So I, you know, to, to some, ex to, to some respect, as much as you can quantify, you know, the, the uh, efficiencies, uh, I, I certainly don't see any indicator of things not getting done. And some of it didn't change, you know, to your point there, Jeremy. I don't know if a lot of it changed that much. I mean, look, none of us are stationed in China as many times as all of us have probably been there. All of, all, most of my dealings with our, uh, you know, vendors overseas and the staff we have over there is like this. Right. You know, so it's not like we're flying back and forth every other week to go say hello and see how things are doing. So that part, I think, is um, we've kind of already all probably been doing that to some extent already. This is just like an extension of that same thing. So, I mean, yeah, you're right. I think people are working harder because they're trying to figure out the schedules as everyone's, you know, everything's all messed up as far as if people have kids running around, tearing up the house or how's that going to flow into your work day. But I do think... Um, yeah, I mean, it hasn't really, I, I will say this situation has not had a huge impact on productivity from, from my point of view, as far I'll as say, I will it's, say that, you know, uh, while working, oh, sorry. That's it, yeah. So I will say that while working from home is a viable option, and I think we're all sort of, um, you know, maybe dinosaurs and how we look at that, right? Like, oh, you got to be at the office, right? Like, that's kind of old school way to look at it. I think we can all say all of us with children is, you know, schooling from home is a no, no. And oh, it's a disaster. <laughs> it's <impossible. laughs> Dude, my kid has a PhD in Roblox. My kid. Yeah. Yeah, mine too. <laughs> yeah. So does mine. Congratulations, by the way. Yeah. Is we'll have to trade usernames. We'll have to trade usernames. And yeah. <laughs> we, we had to take them off the Roblox. It was too much. <laughs> It's funny, my, I, my oldest, I had two kids. One was actually homeschooled and the other went to a uh, regular school. So, I mean, they're older now. They're both out of, you know, pretty much out of college or almost out of college. So that was an interesting experience for me as well. But still, like I said, I think a little earlier, I had a studio with a building outside the house. So it didn't get very distracting. If I had them here in this house, maybe <laughs> may have been a different story. I don't know. So this homeschool versus uh, public school or, or regular school, this isn't like a Roger Clinton, Bill Clinton situation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, we didn't try to make it a contest. <laughs> now, all of you, uh, fortunately, I have had a really good uh, online connection with your fans. You know, I, like, I know Randy and Jeremy, you guys are really active on Twitter. Uh, you know, Jim, you do unboxings, Brian, you've been doing great videos and, you know, the, the Funko crew 
uh, just dominate social media, you know, just making sure you guys are connected with fans. And has this given you guys sort of more time to do some of that? Or do you feel like you're so busy juggling everything else that you haven't had as much time for that, that sort of connection? I mean, it's great that you have those built-in fandoms ready to go when they didn't have to come find you beforehand. I would say that it gave us pause just to kind of do it smarter. You know, we, we have a tendency to bombard people with information just because that's the nature of how we release product. And we are always coming out with a lot of product and, you know, we've got something for everyone. So it's kind of a broad offering of product. So I think during this time we've, we've kind of taken a deep breath and said, okay, you know, how do we uh, convey this information smarter? Um, and so that our, our fans can consume it a little bit uh, easier um, and it doesn't feel like a job, <laughs> uh, all the information that we're pushing. So it's been good for us to kind of take a step back and say, you know, how do we do this so that, you know, it's smarter. Same with us. We totally took this as a beat to reset what we're doing, I think, because yeah, just when you're just moving ahead at the usual clip and suddenly when there's a big giant pause, it does give you a chance to step back and see what we should be doing that was working as opposed to, you know, other ways of communication. So same, same boat for us. We definitely hit the pause button to reset. I, I mean, I'll just say for me, it's been very comforting. Like I, I really love collectors. I love the collector community. And I just, there's honestly, it's one of my top five favorite things to do in life is to communicate with people who also have a passion for this stuff. Um, I won't tell you the other four, but this one is definitely in there. Uh, no, it's just, it's great. I, I think that even when people are being super overly critical, there's a lot to be learned. Um, and, uh, you know, I, 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 I've just really enjoyed that very much. People, people are overly critical of your stuff? Listen, <laughs> uh, yeah. That's yeah, weird. Why not? That's Look. super weird. Oh, huh. Okay. Yeah, I've never had that either. Have you never had that? <laughs> <laughs> News to me. Yeah. Yes. It's, I like to call that a Tuesday. <laughs> all right so uh, we'll sort of wrap up our our uh our quarantine talk here just uh, since people are not at comic con uh if they want to you know you know give you constructive feedback or, or sort of chat with everyone what's the best way that they can do that uh in lieu of you know getting ready to uh, being able to rub elbows with you at the convention like they normally get to send all comments to jeremy <laughs> uh yeah i'll just tell you mine so for me if you want to reach out to me on twitter it's uh at jeremy com and on instagram it's at jeremy padauer p-a-d-a-w-e-r yeah for funko right all the all the social media streams we're we're constantly rubbing elbows right uh we're hearing feedback from our fans we're um engaging with them on um, ideas, licenses, properties. So yeah, just keep doing that. We love it. We love that flow of communication. Yeah, I, I think the thing with all of that social media stuff is I think sometimes people are like, well, why did those comments make it through and mine don't? And it's like, if you preface your comment with, God, this sucks, and that's your, <laughs> um, that isn't going to get a whole lot of things changed. But if you're like, hey, um, I'm really looking at this and technically speaking, this is wrong because of this and here's the screen capture. That's <laughs> going to get you a lot further along to getting an answer and a solve rather than this looks like Godzilla's mom or your sculptor's blind. <laughs> How about you, Randy? How do they get a hold of you? So Facebook and Instagram is NECA official and then Twitter, which is the only one that I personally interact on is uh, NECA underscore toys on Twitter. Excellent. Jim, did you say yours? Uh, yeah, no, ours was uh, still at, our, we still have our Facebook page up. We're actually, we um, still have stuff up on Instagram. We do look at all the comments there. It just BC, uh, well now direct again. <laughs> That's right. Yes. So we do look at that, and well, honestly, though, we look at a lot of the other boards, too. We go to Sculptor Forum. There's a lot of uh, Statue Forum. There's a lot of other places we look around for comments just to see, because, you know, a lot of times people are getting QC issues that I'm never going to see. So it is interesting, like even Jeremy said, when you're getting any kind of, 
you know, critical feedback. It's, it's good to get it because, you know, obviously none of us on this call looking at every single sample that comes out of China. So it is actually interesting to see people post stuff up there and, and we definitely are listening. And I, I just want to add it, at Jazzwares as well, um, just because uh, we, we recently uh, uh, were part of an acquisition uh, where Wicked Cool Toys was acquired by Jazzwares in October. So if there's any confusion there, uh, you reach out at, at Jazzwares. Excellent. So yeah, so uh, you know, now if we kind of start looking back, um, there's been a lot of growth recently. We don't have to go all the way back for the for the 15 years, but I know, uh, you know, like Randy, uh, like NECA has Loot Crate now. Uh, Funko has, you know, you've got like a game division now and an animation studio. Uh, you know, Jim Warner Brothers has, is now part of AT and T. Uh, Jazzwares is, you know, keeps uh, in you expanding like uh, we've never seen before. Like, can we kind of talk about the the transitions that we're seeing and and uh, you know, because if we think about that sort of, you know, we've always sort of thought of toy companies. You know, there's been kind of the the two big guys at the top, Mattel and Hasbro, and then Lego. But you know, it's it just seems like everything just keeps expanding more and more and and when you guys uh, you know 15 years ago were sort of smaller players i think you were really taking a significant chunk and and really carving out your own very interesting paths uh, of late does anyone want to kind of talk about the 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 new developments that you've been seeing in your your organizations yeah, I, I just, I'll just say that, you know, over the last, you know, 15 years, uh, for me, 10 years working um, directly with, uh, with Funko, you know, we've seen a lot of growth. And, you know, as um, Randy was talking about his, his um, you know, expanded shelf space at Mass, you know, I love to see that, right? Like, I, I, it feels like, it feels like, you know, that, 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 that there's the guys up here, right? And then there's these guys, right? And these guys seem to be growing um, and bringing product to market that I think a lot of collectors um, and fans, uh, you know, only could access through alternate channels before. And I feel like that's shifting and it's shifting for the better. Um, and, you know, it, it's bringing this stuff that's this really, this product that's really authentic, right? To market, not, not saying that Hasbro and Mattel is not authentic, they are. But I think that we've got a different um, sort of approach and a different fan base. And we're speaking from a completely different place, right? I mean, you know, people still call Funko a toy company. I'm like, ah, you know, I don't know, right? like Golden Girls. I don't know kids that are buying Golden Girls or Bob Ross. So, but you call us whatever you want. Um, and, and so I, I, lo I love to see that, right? Like, you know, I, I love buying Brian's stuff on hottopic.com, right? They live. I'm like, oh, I'm blown away by the fact that I've now got, I've got a whole shelf in my office of all, you know, most of your guys' products. So um, I love that, right? Seeing that out at retail, major win for everyone. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, it's truly, uh, the collector community is still really engaged. I, I think that is definitely great to see. I mean, our biggest, Really, Dan, to answer your question, the AT&T change was a, obviously a big shift for the studio overall, but probably the, the biggest change for us was going back to the DC Direct name just recently. Yep. Uh, I mean, taking, um, you know, DC Direct with our, with our fancy tagline, Direct from the Source, is where, why we're here. We're like, we're like a toy company embedded within a giant studio, right? So we're supposed to be pulling stuff that's source material, or if we're contributing back source material, like with something like bombshells, that becomes weirdly source material and then goes back out again. Um, yeah, that, that's the big shift for us was really going back to our roots and looking at what editorial's doing, pulling stuff out of what they're doing, making, kind of continuing the storytelling from the, the DC brand. I think we had gotten um, away from that a couple of times over the years and Dan covered us at, at multiple toy fairs, seeing you know, all kinds of different things roll out. And I think going back to our roots, so to speak, is a really cool place for us to be. Uh, we're more involved, we're, we're kind of like involved with consumer product as well. So it's a, um, it's, it's definitely put us back in a place where we're feeling pretty good about everything as far as, as that goes. We have a much more focused uh, mission statement going forward. So that's what, it, that's what where we are right now. 
I mean, I think sort of what everybody's saying is that at, over the last, you know, 20 years, but especially I think in the last five years, it's accelerated where mm -hmm. all of those niche products and things that used to be on the ancillary sidelines of either licensing or distribution, people have realized that there's far more people looking for those than are available and people more and more are opening up their arms, if you will, to be able to carry and sell that stuff. So, you know, it's not that I think the stuff is so radically different in concept. It's just that now you have retailers willing to take a chance on it. And once that proves to be valuable and worthwhile, then that starts everything else, which has benefited all of us. The, you know, it's the democratization of the internet in a lot of ways, it's purchasing price, it's shipping becoming more and more affordable rather than less. Uh, so all of those things have made it so that there's a, a confluence of times where you can actually manufacture this, where a lot of the product that we're making would not have been able to be affordably manufactured 25 years ago, that now you can. You can make runs that are much, much smaller uh, and sell them to a dedicated fan base. Yeah. And I'll just tag on. I, I think that there's been so much change in terms of the perception of who the consumer is uh, from both the manufacturer and the retail level. Um, and so, for instance, you know, 20 years ago when I was at Mattel, um, the collector of I'm just looking I'm looking uh, at all the uh, He-Man stuff, the Masters Universe stuff there. And I worked on that 20 years ago when we brought it back. And the, the perception was fanboys, fanboys, nerds. 40 year old virgins. Now it's mainstream. You can cut, chop that all down to mainstream collector, investment grade collector, very serious business. And I think if you look at the intended recipients of the couple billion dollar, one and a half to $2 billion a year, uh, you know, category, I think it's like 30 to 35% of the intended recipients are collectors. And it's just, it's just a very serious business. Um, from a, from a retail perspective, you know, obviously things have changed pretty dramatically too with the loss of Toys R Us. And, you know, I think Amazon and, and the dot coms have picked up a lot of that business and the direct opportunity has picked up a lot of that business as well. But uh, it's certainly a whole different world. And, and frankly speaking, from a content perspective, and you can see at Jazzwares, you know, Roblox and Fortnite, Pokemon, and these types of brands, uh, whether they be um, YouTube driven or whether they be gaming driven, it's uh, again, tends to be a little bit more older age consumer, tends to be a little bit more uh, people who are living a lifestyle versus collecting toys. That's, yeah, that's, that's true. When we had our Batman 80th anniversary at San Diego Comic-Con, we did that one-to-one -one Todd, Todd McFarlane statue and they auctioned it off, but it sold the same day. So yeah, it's a pretty, people, it's definitely a different kind of collector. You're right, it's not just old guys living in caves, piling up, well, piling up stuff. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah. nope. No caves here. <laughs> yeah. Turn the, no, it's turn definitely the not. On. It's definitely not that. No, <laughs> no way. <laughs> okay, it's that too. It's that too. Sure. <laughs> and Randy, with, with, with the caves are actually in charge now. That's the difference. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's absolutely <laughs> And Randy, with the with like the loot crate uh, acquisition, uh, it's it's so interesting to me because NECA was really the first company I can remember that when you guys pursued a license, it wasn't just for toys. You were like, hey, we can make you know shot glasses and flags and and all sorts of other things. And and I think not everyone prior to you guys was was thinking in those terms. So it it seems like when when you first heard about that acquisition it was like oh well yeah that makes complete sense yeah um, like you mentioned and when i first started here there was a lot of that um ancillary merchandise and giftware and stuff of that nature we were doing a lot of uh master license deals where it was a whole program or a pull together and not just you know one or two categories and then as it grew certainly when things really exploded during like the twilight years when we did some Twilight figures, but it wasn't really a toy property, but everything else we did, whether it was jewelry or uh, giftware or replicas of the uh, clothing, stuff like that, like all of it sold. And then Hunger Games right after that. Um, so it's good that we've always had that breadth of product category and assortment and attracting new people in like that. Certainly those two brands skewed way 
uh, more to the tweens and females and stuff that we weren't normally selling to. And then we had our core fan that we started building like with what we did with Hellraiser way back when and uh, Freddie and Jason and all the slashers and stuff like that. So we, we've always had a pretty broad uh, model as far as that goes. And as you know, we've known each other for probably 20 years and over the last 15, so much has changed with, um, you know, when we started out, we were primarily in the malls. So it was like Spencer's, Hot Topic, Tower, right. when they used to be around, you know, stuff like that. And then Toys R Us became sort of our big brick and mortar uh, partner, at least domestically. And then a couple of years ago, that went away. Um, thankfully, Target and now Walmart has stepped up to put collector programs into their entertainment section, um, which has been a huge um, win for us and for collectors because it's in more doorways and at lower prices than, uh, you know, than certainly when it would have been at the shopping malls and stuff like that. Um, and along the way, we've acquired a lot of different companies. This first was WizKids and then uh, Kid Robot. Yep. And it's recently, uh, like last year, Loot Crate, like you mentioned, because um, there is value in that subscription model. And as the success we've had with like the Ninja Turtles crate, which is now recurring in a quarterly crate, we're able to pack in a special figure and then all this extra merchandise that goes along with that theme, be it apparel, a pin, a headband from the Foot Clan, all sorts of stuff that just makes sense to bundle together. Um, and it's just good. It's it's more variety, more choices for the consumer. Um, you know, and with our licenses, we're able to overlap and share with in the different you know divisions that NECA as an entity holds. Sometimes we share licenses with one another, or are able to do a poll together more consistently. Um, and have success with something like Bob Ross last year where we had a figure, but we had a plush and a Chia pet and some other things. And now we're looking to do the same thing with the recently revealed Richard Simmons across a bunch of different categories. <laughs> Just thinking outside the box and doing stuff. Everyone knows it and recognizes it, but it hadn't been done before. And it doesn't go to our core alien or predator collector, but it goes to a much broader base that <laughs> the cool. toy guys don't think about and realize like, we had tremendous success with Golden Girls and with Bob Ross. We're going to have that same success, and maybe even more so with Richard Simmons. Where is the alien's chia pet? <laughs> <laughs> hey, you got a child chia pet and a Chewbacca. What more do you want? Yeah, we do. So, yeah, uh, th speaking of that, that that is something that, you know, again, sort of like we talk about with, you know, sort of the – the, the big guys on top and then the next tier, like you guys, all of your companies, I feel like in the past year have just, every one of you have, have given us some sort, uh, especially me as like a longtime collector, some sort of just delightful surprise, like a Richard Simmons, like a uh, micro machines coming back, uh, you know, like a, you know, like a, a, a Marvel Conan figure. I mean, there's just, there's so, you know, every, every new announcement from Funko is just like, who would have thought there'd ever be product of, you know, fill in the blank. And of course, Jim continuing the Batman animated series line, which I have behind oh, me yeah. uh, over here. By, by the way, Andrew, Andrew's scribbling down fill in the blank right now. Fill <laughs> <laughs> in the blank. They're going to sell a billion units. Way to go. <laughs> Once again. <laughs> so can you talk about just that? Uh, again, that's the, there's a lot of sort of outside the box thinking, I feel like, and, and uh, just pursuing those, those things that, you know, wouldn't necessarily be the top things on the, you know, on the whiteboard. That's what makes them magic, right? I mean, I think that is what taps into sort of like the nostalgia. You know, Richard Simmons is awesome. You guys should do a Susan Powers. Uh, to go with it. Like that could be the chase piece, right? Like, right? Like it's just stuff that we, that we all saw growing up. And, you know, it, 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 it lets you connect with this moment of your past. And like, yeah, the big guys can't do that. Like, what are they going to do? That's just not in their wheelhouse. And so I think that it's kind of carved out this nice, area for you know those of us nerds who just like to make stuff we really just want to be honest with you right like i think that's kind of the magic um there's not a lot of formulas that we have to follow like some of the bigger companies have to follow and i think that's the magic in and of itself 
I do get asked that question a lot. I think that's a really good answer because yeah, it's not like we all get in a room and be like, that's it. Perfect. We can't put the next big yeah. thing. I mean, I think sometimes you just hit it right. Like, yeah, when Dan, thanks for pointing out that Batman animated series, because you know, at that point we had already gone through like 50 characters and the Batmobile and a bat cave and a giant bat wing. And we're thinking, well, what else can we possibly do? Like, you know, just putting out Clock King, as fun as that would be, or Condiment King. You know, I'm not really sure how many of those we're gonna move. So going back and saying, what else can we do with this line? We're like, well, we could do other characters that weren't even on the show in this style because the nostalgia factor is still there for that. I mean, a lot of people consider that their favorite Batman ever is the, you know, the animated series one. A lot of people grew up on it. And so if we can extend that experience by coming up with other characters that are meaningful, and putting them in the line to keep this this going, that's that's great for us. And then we showed it to editorial, and they liked it so much they brought Paul Dini back on to start writing comic books again. So love it. I mean, that's that's a great synergy, and one of the things that you know I don't have to, uh, I guess keep. I, oh, I have to not worry about as much as everybody else here. I mean, I'm in a company where we have a property, a bunch of properties, right? We have our own IP. I don't really have to run around trying to figure out what's happening with all these other things. I mean, I do collect a lot of stuff myself. So I, I like a lot of other properties. Look, I got a Conan, I got a Thor and a Conan comic book right there on my shelf. But um, I think, uh, yeah, for us, it was really trying to find what else can we do with these DC characters that people are going to, to care about. So that's what we're trying to innovate in that space. Um, yeah, but I do love that Bob Ross stuff, Randy. That was, that was, pretty, that was pretty amazing. Well, Jim, one other I, I think I should point out for you guys that I... I, I oh, wait a minute. We, First of all, Brandy, is that is that a Chia beard too? Or, that or that is my Chia beard, yeah. It's, <laughs> oh, for Randy too? Oh, both. <laughs> <I'm dead>. uh, <laughs> but Jim, right, I think... You better water your Chia pet, man. <laughs> it died. <laughs> Gotta water that thing. It died. <laughs> Jim, I, I think another one that we have talked about that I think is so uh, innovative is your Artist Alley line because no, you, you, it's uh, you don't think of sort of the big IP holders letting you sort of mess with their, mm. you know, sort of their core characters and stuff, you know, and we've we've seen it throughout the history of of DC, like in the mass market where it was like. Well, we're we're starting. Uh, we're trying to do a live-action Aquaman show, so mm -hmm. it's going to be too conf too confusing to have Aquaman on like Justice League. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. to let them, you know, for them, for you to be able to pitch that and go, well, yeah, we're going to have Batman. He's going to look like a cartoon bat, you know, stuff like that. I, I think that's that's really really fun. Again, surprising outside the box thinking on stuff. And that's why, I mean, again, one of the re a nice plug for Aquaman, as usual, by the way. But that, <laughs> that's, that's, that, is, that is one of the reasons, again, one of the reasons we're here. I mean, we're at these, and I, that's one of the reasons I am going to miss these conventions a lot, like besides just the interaction with people. We were, we, that program literally came from us walking around through all the indie art sections or going to Decon or whatever and saying, what else is out there that, that I can do when I don't have to move like 10 billion units, even to what Brian was saying earlier, you can do a lot more short runs now because the technology is different and so much has changed. So finding art out there that's really interesting that people haven't seen before and applying to our characters since we are the IP holder, it makes, you know, and honestly makes my life a, a little easier in that respect. I mean, not, I'll tell you, not everybody liked all of them. That's, that's for sure. But that's why we went out there with a bunch of different styles because it isn't supposed to be a, a really a cohesive line. I mean, it's just this James Roman stuff's really cool or Christy Zulo stuff is really cute. So there's just, it just goes all over the place. And that's probably the, the, one of the design team's favorite lines to work on because we can just go all over the place and just pull pretty much wherever we want. Assuming they, we sell en enough, you know, but it's a really, it's a really cool experimental line. Um, and we had a lot of, we definitely had a lot of fun with that one. I think what you're seeing so much now with all of this, what you were talking about, Daniel, is that you're seeing the personalities of the brands. Inevitably, as you get bigger and bigger and bigger, those sharp edges that brands have of their personality and their interests get rounded off more and more and more. And you start to run into limitations of skew counts and distribution centers or any number of other things. So at this level, 
you can still really go out into the fringes and find those weird things that you're interested in and that you want to make that maybe nobody else does. And I think that's what allows us to all have a unique point of view. Cause I think anybody on here can say like that they have certain fans of theirs. They're like, I love what you do, but I don't like what this other company does where we might sit in a room and go, there's not a huge shift between what the two of us make, but it's the personality and tone of voice and point of view of the brand that they're really resonating with more so than the product. And I think that that's really what allows, I think all of us to be really making the, the more esoteric stuff that we're making that is what makes it so much more fun than just making the same thing over and over again. Right. Yeah. I literally just had a conversation with um, the head of our game studio and we were kind of nerding out on a property that all you guys know and love. I can't talk about it right now, but you'll know when you see it. And we were like, the world just needs this, right? Like, I don't think we're going to cover our costs on it. <laughs> needs but this license in a board game format and guys like us will sit around a table and completely nerd out on it. Uh, and like, you know what, if we sell a hundred copies, you know, take it out of my check. I don't really care, but it's a game for this property. Uh, you'll see that, you'll see that coming probably in 21, maybe even 22. So. I can't wait to play WKRP game. <laughs> yes! Yes! You have to guess. <laughs> I get to be Venus. That's all I'm saying. I'm Venus. Yeah. Venus yes. Oh, he's the best. Well, you know, something else, like, I mean, if you think back, like if we take Ninja Turtles, for example, I know like Randy, when NECA first started doing Ninja Turtles, you were kind of, you bumped up against Playmates a little bit. They were, they were swinging their weight around uh, a bit in what you could do. But, you know, it, every single one of you guys on this call has had uh, a Ninja Turtle property, which is kind of kind of nutty oh, yeah. <laughs> you know when you think about it like like jeremy you did a like a pizza oven you know you took that sort of classic <laughs> uh classic easy thank bake oven thank yeah. you for mentioning that by the way i <laughs> i think that's brilliant when i first saw that in stores i was like well how yeah how come no one's yeah. taken that concept and applied something else so like yeah now we can all have you know these different uh, interpretations of the Ninja Turtles. And I think that that's been really interesting to see some of these different licenses. Another one for, uh, you know, I think Randy, uh, you know, who would have thought at some point that you would be, be able to, you know, make like the predator from dead end and stuff, you know, like these licensors, I mean, do you find that now that because I know when I've had, you know, again, this is like 15 years of doing this, talking about sort of the license holders, there, there used to be a lot of them that were sort of clueless. Some of them didn't even know that they had it. You would have to come to them and say, no, you are the keeper of this. But then still being able to explain this is what we do and this is what people would like. I mean, is that, have we found a shift in that a little bit? Is it more sort of uh, the same idea of we're, you know, the, we're the guys that played with, you know, the, all the Kenner stuff and now we're making the toys that we've always wanted to see. Are we seeing that in the, on the licensing side of things too? Uh, in my experience, not as much as I'd like. I think there's still a lot of us having to provide that education or context to sell those ideas in. Um, once in a while, you'll get that sort of refreshing feeling where there's someone on the other end that from the same school and, and knows what you're talking about and is collected or is at least familiar with what's come before. And then there's other times where I just look at the computer or at the phone and wonder if they've ever even seen the movie that we're talking about. <laughs> I'm, you know, just being honest, I'm not naming names, but it ha that happens more often than, you know, than it should. Okay. I think the difference probably now for Randy and for everybody else here is that once you start having success, and they start seeing the royalty check show up. The, I think that there's just more appetite in most places to be just like, well, I don't understand this, but if you're going to meet those numbers that you're projecting, then I'll let you, then I'll let you send me the check. I think that's fair. And I think it's also fair to say that it's broadening. I mean, I, I, a lot of the things that licensors do, they, they have to balance the concept of slicensing, which is very cannibalistic. Mm -hmm. uh, with the concept of adding value. 
And um, I think you've seen many examples of platforms that add value and that layer on top of master toy licenses quite well. Um, but there's also examples of the converse where, where it, you know, you're just taking from the same pie and making a brand less productive on a skew to skew basis. So it's, it, it really is to some extent, I would say a good licensor does it on a trial and error basis and says, let's see what happens if I introduce this. Okay. What was my productivity? Did I really expand the pie? Am I harming any of the business? Because frankly speaking, I think everyone here will tell you that is much as you want 16 feet of space, that's not necessarily good for longevity if eight feet is the efficient and the productive space. So at the end of the day, you want productivity over everything. And now I've bored everyone. <laughs> <laughs> that's when they all die. <laughs> and no one has anything else to say because that's <laughs> Yeah, uh, <laughs> all the cute, all the cute <laughs> toy back up. <laughs> Wait, what? Oh my god! Don't play that game. So like, get out the scissors. <laughs> Why does everyone have scissors? <laughs> I don't know. That's what you do during COVID. You, you have yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, Daniel, congratulations, man! Fifteen years. You. Yeah, I'll tell you what. You've really, you've really made a giant footprint in this industry. And I think that everyone has a tremendous amount of respect for you and, and knows you as like the glue um, for a lot of what's happening. And, and it's, it's great that you're such a critical part of this industry and we're, you know, we all look to you as, as someone to help congregate us all. And thank you for continuing to do it. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, I, my, my, I have always been just interested in how the sausage gets made, you know, so <laughs> I've, I've always tried to, you know, we know fandom uh, has their own frustrations and things. And, and I've always kind of wanted to be that, that, uh, you know, the, the guy in the middle, like decisions get made for a reason and we might not like them, but I'm always like, well, let's figure out why, you know, why that happened that sort of thing, instead of just everyone, get your pitchforks or we're starting a petition or, you know, whatever thing like that. Like, let's have those conversations. And, you know, you guys, uh, you know, being, being my friends and, and, and trusting me with that sort of thing, I, I greatly appreciate it um, because I would not be able to do, you know, and it wouldn't keep being fun for me if you guys did not uh, trust me with stuff uh, also, because, you know, you, you do tell me things that I don't, I don't get to share with the world. Uh, but you also uh, give me the access to be able to uh, maybe sort of smooth smooth some of those edges and and calm the angry hordes uh, on occasion. So, so thank you for. Yeah, I'll be calling you later today. I got one. All right. <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you. Sounds oh, it's true. Not not a toy fair, Dan, without seeing you walking around the aisle, and even like talking to everybody on this panel is just reminds me if you know. If we have toy fair, great, but I mean, um, you know, walking down the aisle, we're all in is such a unique experience and all the rest of toy fair, in my opinion, it's a, it's, its own little kind of niche thing. I brought a bunch of stuff back from East. So I started unpacking all these old, I mean, even this thing, my grandmother bought me this, what is this thing? This is all oh, these old Marx brothers, Viking guy and the sword broke off sadly. So that's too bad. But I moved so much stuff out here of just like stuff that was important to me when I was a kid and getting, being able to work in this industry and, you know, giving back some of that joy in some cases is, it's pretty cool. I mean, it's, it's really a, not a job I went to school for, <laughs> but it's, uh, <laughs> it, it actually, uh, there wasn't even classes for that kind of stuff. So it worked out pretty well though. I and mean, it's a really awesome industry we're in. And I'm really happy to be part of the, these kind of collectible, mob that we're in it's a really really cool place to be i love i just you know, love talking to people about all this stuff and uh yeah thanks again for putting this panel together it's great to see all you guys kind of <laughs> yes well yeah that that's something uh, you know we've talked about in previous panels where you know when you think about kind of the early days of toys and even kind of back in the like the kenner days like a lot mm -hmm. of these guys did not go to school for this. You know, they went for industrial design and they thought they'd, a lot of them wanted to design cars mm -hmm. and ended up in the toy industry. And I think that is why we have had such 
a golden age now because this is a job and this is something you can pursue. And the people that played with action figures and loved them uh, are now the ones making them and making the stuff they always wanted to see. And that is such a delightful time to be in uh, as a collector. So good times. We really appreciate it, Daniel. Thank you for having us all here today. This is amazing. Yes, thank you guys very much. Uh, I, I, I truly appreciate it. I miss seeing you all in person, seeing all the, the delightful stuff that you would normally be showing us at, at Comic-Con. And I just, I can't wait to see what is next for each of you. And uh, I, I, I pray to the sweet baby Jesus that will be in the Javits Center again uh come february of next year you know we might be in full you know like the the guys that came for et at the end of the movie uh when we're in there but uh, i would very much like to see you all again uh, if you could make those suits licensed you'd make a million oh. there you go that's true you got your pokemon suit or your star wars suit I'm, you're ready that's it that's right. a bigger job. We're just coming up with million dollar ideas left and right well, and here. And yeah, while, wow. while I've seen some baby Jesus figures, I haven't seen any sweet baby Jesus figures. So <laughs> but, I'm sure uh, one of those guys are up for that. Yes. I, be I believe Sweet Baby Jesus was the name of the band that became Green Day. <laughs> true story. Is that really so, true? Really? That, that, would be the, that would be their first couple tracks on the double seven inch Turn It Around from MRR. <laughs> <laughs> in the very beginning, before Lookout Records came out. Then they changed the name to Green Day. So there you go. It was wow. Sweet Baby. Now we've all learned something. So it's not just fun, it's educational. Yeah. <laughs> no one cared. We I learned. care? <laughs> well. All right, so thank you guys very much. Let's, uh, let's finish up with just a, a shout out of where, once again, where people find you guys. Like if you want to give a, a URL or, or whatever, just so they can find all the magic stuff and all the, the, the blunt tears that you guys have been pouring into this stuff over the years. We'll start with Randy. Well, since I didn't say it last time. I'll say uh, at original .com, at original funco is our handle on, uh, on pretty much every social media platform. So awesome. Purveyors of good stuff. And then at, at jazzwares, wherever you may find that. And if you're looking for me, you can find me additionally. Yes. And we're at dcdirect.com. Same thing, wherever you cook us up, just type in DC Direct and we should show up. Uh, we're at Super7 uh, uh, at Super7 on Instagram and Super7 on Facebook, Super7.com. And then I'm at Brian Flynn on Instagram because I don't go anywhere else. <laughs> uh, NECAonline.com and then NECA Official on Facebook and Instagram and NECA underscore toys on Twitter. And when stores finally open up again, I know uh, Super 7, you've got two stores, right? And then Funko's got two stores. Are those guys open yet? 
We're uh, open for business. You're, you guys are we're, open. We're for open. You, you, can, you can call in and talk to Daniel or TJ, and he can pull something for you, but no one's going in the store yet. Fair enough. All right, gentlemen. Thank you so much for your time. I greatly appreciate it. Happy Comic Con at home. And uh, we'll all be in touch. Stay safe and keep keep doing the Lord's work. All right. Bye, you got everybody. It, man. Thanks, Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank Bye. you, everybody.